Welcome to Complete Kids Online. Friendly discussions about autism and other developmental disability. Learn how working together is working better. One conversation at a time. Hello, welcome to Complete Kids Online. I'm Gina. And I'm Bob. And we are here with Kyle. Kyle is a former CODA in our Gastonia office. Um, so why don't you explain what that is? Uh, pediatric OT or the CODA OTR relationship? What a CODA is. So a CODA is a certified occupational therapy assistant. Uh, we work under the supervising occupational therapist to basically uh, continue the plan of care for every child that is in our caseload. So um, what's the difference between a CODA and an OT? So the occupational therapist is the initial point of contact for most cases. They will um, conduct all of the um, assessments like the Peabody, depending on the deficit that the child is exhibiting. Um, so they perform all the initial assessments and then they basically also conduct the entire um, you, you know, the formation of the goals. Um, as a CODA, we're able to um, collaborate on those. However, the occupational therapist drafts the entire plan of care for the child. Is it normally progression, Kyle? Like, do you start as a CODA and then go to OT, or is that is it two separate things traditionally? Uh, that, that's certainly um, a path that most CODAs take, I feel like. Um, so the CODA um, program is a two-year program, whereas a um, uh, occupational therapist finishes their undergrad and then continues with a two-year uh, graduate degree as well. Um, Got it. And then from there, it's it's a variety of different populations they can work with. Got it. And what does um, OT help with for kids specifically? So the areas of deficit for children are, uh, it's a very wide array of issues. So um, for occupational therapy, especially dealing with children with developmental disabilities, it could be anywhere from fine motor development to sensory integration to behavioral modification. It, the the areas, I mean, I could spend an hour and a half just detailing every single step of the way wow. of what we yeah. can assist with. It, it's, it's all encompassing for sure. So talk about the swing. I, whenever I go into the OT area, I always see the swing going on. Explain this whole yeah. swing thing. In headphones. Um, Yes, and the headphones, head, yeah. headphones on the swing. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, Complete Kids uh, took more of a sensory motor uh, model, whereas a lot of the times we were using vestibular input, which is the swing, in conjunction with the therapeutic listening program, which is designed for a variety of things. So if a child is in such a high state of a constant arousal, we would use those two modalities to basically bring them down um, and vice versa. If a child is very, you know, low affect and low energy, we can use those two modalities to also bring them up as well. Um, it assists with sensory modulation and interpretation. Um, the, basically what it is with a lot of children, especially the ones that we are treating, um, that there's a lot of sensory difficulties and deficiencies. So providing that um, sensory input is is a you, you know a modality that can work on a variety of different things for sure. What is sensory modulation? So sensory <laughs> for those of well, us that don't really aren't really sure about this, Kyle. <laughs> so um, children with developmental disabilities do not interpret sensory stimuli as we would, um, that they can have, you, you know, behavioral responses, outbursts. Um, and a lot of these outbursts are very misinterpreted. Um, sensory modulation interpretation is just basically encouraging and promoting a child to interpret that sensory stimuli in an appropriate manner. Now, this can take days, weeks, months, years. The, the, temporal component is a complete question mark based on a case-to-case -case basis. So, um, you, you know, providing sensory stimuli in a controlled professional environment um, goes a long way for a lot of kids, for sure. 
Um, so how um, does the therapeutic listening program, how does that help with sensory modulation? Wow. Um, okay. So the therapeutic listening program, um, not everybody uses it. Um, it is, like I said earlier, it, it's basically designed to either increase or decrease levels of arousal. So um, just like vestibular input or tactile or proprioceptive input, there's also auditory input. And, um, you, you know, the therapeutic listening program goes in conjunction with the vestibular, vestibular input. You are able to, get, you know, use therapeutic listening outside of the swing. Um, however, it's most effective. Um, and, and I mean, I'm sure you've seen it, Gina, like, um, well, we could be presented with a child who is just off the walls, hyperactive. And, uh, you, you know, after a week or two on the swing with the therapeutic listening, they're able to maintain at least you, you know, a short duration of increased attention, uh, decreased emotional outbursts, things like that. Um, the therapeutic listening is, in my opinion, one of the best things that, you, you know, I've ever worked with because it's the, one of the objective modalities I've seen to work through almost every single one of my children. Um, but, and it'll happen it, that quickly. You you mentioned like a couple of weeks. It'll, you'll see um, for, for yeah yeah so so, so you, you you know um sometimes there would the child would be in weekly uh bi-weekly uh it could be on a day-to-day -day basis um it really depends uh, i mean in order to be the most effective you want to utilize it almost every day um however we were seeing them two times a week for an hour or so um you, you know sometimes it can take you, you know months but uh, mm -hmm. I would say in my three and a half years of utilizing the therapeutic listening program, on average, I would see a pretty significant difference around the three to four week period. Wow. Um, and, and like I said, that that's everything. That's, you know, increased attention, decreased behavioral instances, um, improved uh, social communication and participation, uh, improved sleep pattern. It, it's really wild. Uh the objective measurements I've seen with that, you know, therapeutic listening program. That's incredible. So you, you talked about, you know, sometimes you're only seen once a week, twice a week, you know, for whatever reasons, what are some things that parents can do to kind of supplement what you're doing in the clinic? Or is there anything? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, you know, at most we would see most children for two hours a week, which yeah, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to see them 15, 20 hours a week. That's right. that's how we can show the most progress. However, that's impossible. And the the parent is the primary, you, you know, point of where we put a lot of focus, um, especially because, you, you know, they're with the child 24 seven. So, right. um, man, well, what can the parents do? Uh, I, I mean, I would say number one is definitely listen to the dietary um, guidelines that a lot of therapists will provide them. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know that's extremely difficult. However, um, we would have a lot of kids come in with a lot of just poor nutrition, and that is not a very conducive diet towards continued progress. Um, you know, once again, these are children, they're brains and their bodies are constantly, you know, growing and building. So they need those, you know, building blocks to really improve upon. So um, that um, parent carryover for a lot of the HEPs, which for some people that don't know is a home exercise program, um, you, you know, we would lay out HEPs daily. And the, the parent carryover, I would probably say is in the maybe 30 to 40% area. Um, and well, you, you meaning, know, meaning what, Kyle? Meaning that 30, 40 percent will actually um, help you 30 with that? To 40 or? 30 to 40 percent of my parents were actually listening to my HEP gotcha. and conducting it on a daily basis. Um, and and did you see, could you tell without knowing, you, you know what I'm getting at, could you tell? Absolutely. Absolutely. The have um, for the have nots or the do's for the do, do nots? Absolutely. Um, especially because we're working on such things as you know, reflex integration and posture and positioning and muscle development and things like that. Um, without the carryover in home, um, it's a pretty noticeable, you, you know, difference. Cause like you said, the, the haves and the haves not like, I know who's doing it. Um, right. But once again, you, you know, we have to exhibit 
you know, some empathy because I know all parents are, you know, dealing with children that are crazy and they're spontaneous. So, um, you, you know, I always tried to make my HEPs as achievable as possible um, without being too, you know, exerting on the parents' time and things like that. So, mm. and, you know, it's, it's really hard to maintain the attention of a kid. Like it's right. really hard. So, <laughs> I, uh, I always understood, you, you know, when parents are like, hey, we didn't do the exercises this week. And, you, you know, you, you just got to go with it. You just got to mm -hmm. keep constantly adapting every single week. So it, it's fun. It's a puzzle. Yeah, <laughs> right, for right. sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I loved about the outpatient setting. Because, you know, when I worked in the schools, you had kids that now I know were completely dysregulated and they weren't yeah. ready to learn. Um, and it yeah. wasn't until... I learned from the OTs, like, this is what that looks like. And that's how it's yeah. coming out. And this is how we fix it. And then those kids were ready for speech and ready to yeah. learn. And, and you, you know, the schools just, and to their point, they're doing the best they can with the funding that they have. I've worked in some schools that, you, you know, I wish were on every corner of America. Um, I've also worked in schools with very, very little funding that um, are just trying their best. And, 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 you know, in the school system, it's difficult because, you know, as much as we're able to work on fine motor, um, feeding, uh, behavior modification, all these different things, schools don't have those resources. So they don't, they're not always able to work on sensory. And it, a lot of it does come down to just time and funding for that. So, um, you, you know, I was in a very fortunate position where I, I, you know, worked with some amazing supervising OTRs who basically, um, you, you know, basically set the grounds for a lot of different areas to work on, which was nice. Yeah, but I think it just for my untrained eye, I see, you know, Gina brings up a good point. You know, we always joke, what does an OT do, right? It's the, <laughs> what is, well, <laughs> that's the running joke in the, in the company. But yeah. what I see is at the OT, definitely, you know, Gina brought up the example, but I see it in all disciplines, OT, um, helps those other disciplines, you know, the speech, the, the physical therapist, the ABA, get those kids ready to do the other therapies. For sure. For Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's really funny because, uh, I mean, OT is kind of all-encompassing of a lot of different therapies. So, mm -hmm. so just like Gina and speech, like sometimes – we cross that boundary into feeding where I, I know the act of feeding is kind of an OT thing. Whereas, um, you know, actually eating, I think it was part of chewing your and yeah. yeah, chewing in that part. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then just, just along the lines of physical therapy, um, you, you know, occupational therapy works on trunk control and strengthening. And a lot of that just gross motor strengthening that physical therapy does. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny because I've like once again with the OTs, I've worked with some great speech therapists and not physical therapists. Um, and it's really nice to have that interdisciplinary communication because um, you're able to look at the child constantly as a whole individual and not really just focus on your area of therapy. Um, so, you know, collaborating with speech and physical therapy is a is a daily and if not hourly thing. Um mm -hmm. I always loved getting as much input from them as possible, for sure. And we always get feedback, you know, in the marketing and social media department from both parents and from pediatrician's office. They love that we have all those things under one roof for exactly the reason yeah. you just said. Well, A, because parents don't have to take the kid to, you know, three different places. And B, for exactly the interaction that you just talked about. Yeah. And uh, it made it incredibly easy to just walk right down the hall and go talk to Gina or Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, while also, you, you know, sometimes talking to Casey and be like, hey, um, what exactly do you see a different gait pattern? Is this something that I need to be working on? Is it a shortened Achilles? These type of things. Um, you, you know, it's it's really, really nice to have that and not have to, like, go outside of the clinic for that or something, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. I think I learned more from everybody else than I did from all of grad school. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, you, you know, schooling in itself was great. It prepares you and things like that. But um, there's a lot of things school does not prepare you for. <laughs> um, so, like, so the, look, like, like, like the marketing guy on a podcast. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it, it's it's also the, the, the smaller things that you would never think about, like school. Yeah. Um, you know, just barely touches on how to 
um, submit to insurance or how to speak to insurance or things like that, how to deal with irate parents. Um, right. it, 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 you know, the, those are the type of things that you just learn as you grow. And I remember my first year, I, I was afraid of everything. I was like, I don't know if this parent's yelling at me. I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, towards year three, four, it, it becomes much clearer that, you know, we're all fighting our own battles and, uh, they're not mad at me. They're just kind of mad at the situation. They're, they're always, you know, kind of, you know, processing their own things, you know? So yeah, I'm sure some frustration, uh, you know, for, Oh, for sure. Not yeah. doing anything um, you're doing, just life. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of parents don't know how to process your child has autism. Like right. that, that is a really, really hard, you know, situation to overcome. So uh, mm -hmm. the best we can do as practitioners is to just reassure them it's going to be okay and work with their children to the best of our abilities for sure. Yeah. So what's next for you? Today or career wise? <laughs> <laughs> is there a difference? <laughs> no, no, not at all anymore. Only because I know you live day to day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Well, you, you know, I live at the beach now and it's warm weather. So I was like, I'm going to go fish. Um, well, uh, what's next for me? Um, I guess I'm going to start preparing for the OTA Inspire Conference out in Kansas City, which is in April. Um, and then just keep, you know, continuing with our continue education. Um, I'd like mm -hmm. to get a couple more certifications under my belt. Um, but at the same time, it's just it's it's become a crazy world out there. So yeah. what's next is a is a constant question. <laughs> <laughs> Kansas City going to be tough for you after the Super Bowl? Oh, I didn't even think about that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you? Yeah, you, I guess. Were you rooting Chiefs? Oh no, I'm I'm Eagles all the way, man. I was in Philadelphia for it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was uh, Kansas City through. I knew that. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, it's all right, man. Um, I it was a great game. What can you say? But um, you, you know, Kansas City is going to be really cool because uh, you you know, it's like over 200 speakers and. There's hundreds of opportunities to learn from other OTs. And, uh, you, you know, I'm constantly looking to every practitioner I can for education. So it's going to be nice to have that all under one roof for sure. It's, it's like a three day conference out there. It's pretty wild. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> so we always um, wrap with asking. So, you know, how the Complete Kids has the um, superhero themes. Yeah. So we ask our podcast guests um if and just like we do on our bios internally um if you could have any superpower what would that be okay so so i did take a little bit time to think about this um I'm glad, not much. i would hate to see what the first thing would come out of your mouth was so like, thank you not that. much time thank you gina <laughs> um i feel like if i was to pick a superpower it would to be it, it would be to easily talk my way out of things uh, like, you already have that superpower pick something you don't have <laughs> oh man i, I felt no, like kidding. that was pretty good uh, no I it is pretty good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time like, that's actually a good one <laughs> like just to <laughs> constantly segue myself out of uncomfortable situations that's my superpower that's <laughs> a pretty good one that's a pretty good that's one. all i got man all right <laughs> all well right. thanks for being here today with us yeah, of course. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you guys in the uh, next couple of weeks. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, definitely make a point to see us. Absolutely, man. Thanks again, Kyle. You, Appreciate all the help. It was actually we really, for me, it was a really informative uh, a podcast. So thanks, man. Great. Oh, 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 just doing what I can, man. It was good seeing you guys. <laughs> to continue the conversation, visit the links to our website, Facebook page, Instagram, and the comments.